There are these stories in the scriptures that Jesus made up and told in order to prove profound points about the world that we live in. These stories are called parables. And I remember one parable in particular that has often stuck with me over the years, partially because it was talked about so much in church, but also because it was simply so startling. The story starts and in the parable, there's this man who gets beaten, literally everything taken away from him, including his clothes, and he's left dying on the side of the road. First, a priest is walking along the road. He sees the man dying on the side of the road and he goes to the other side. He carries on walking without stopping to help the man. Secondly, a Levite, which is kind of repetitive because all priests at that time were Levites, but he was being from the tribe of Levi. So now we have an ordinary person from the tribe of Levi who also sees the dying man as he's walking along, but he goes to the other side and carries on walking without stopping to help the man. Lastly, a Samaritan is walking along the road which a Samaritan to those listening to Jesus' parable at the time were looked down upon as traitors, half-breeds, and the list goes on and on. But basically there was a lot of hatred toward the Samaritans. And the Samaritan stops to help the dying man. He actually goes above and beyond, pays for the man's lodging and full recovery, which would, which would have been a shock to the listeners because in their minds, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. And Jesus told this parable in order to invite us to love everyone as our neighbors, even those whom we were previously considered enemies. But I want to explore a deeper question here. Why didn't the priest and Levi stop? And why did the Samaritan stop? Well, that might seem like an unanswerable question. It actually is quite answerable. I think the answer might challenge us. You see, priests and Levites, they follow the commandments of the Torah, which many of the commandments in the Torah have to do with ritual purity, being clean. And here's one of those particular commands in the book of Numbers. It says, whoever touches a dead body of anyone shall be unclean for seven days. You see, if they were to help this man and the man ended up dying, they would have been unclean for seven days. This means that they couldn't return home without ceremonial washing. They couldn't go to the temple. In large fall, they probably would have to throw out their food that they were likely carrying because that's why they would have been on that road in the first place. And thus, they would be unable to feed their family with the food that now would be unclean as well. It was their commitment to the laws that surprisingly got in the way of their ability to love the man who was dying by helping him. Yet the Samaritan, who was often criticized for not following all the laws, was able to help the dying man because of his disregard for some of these laws. Which leads to the larger question that I think we need to consider. What laws are stopping us from loving people? And I don't even mean literal laws in some ways. I think there are unwritten laws, our way of life, the systems we have in place that we feel like we're supposed to submit to that may sometimes inhibit our ability to love well. There is the unwritten law of social categories. Cool, uncool, Christian, non-Christian, rich, poor, gay, straight, you name it. We have all these categories set up in our mind from society, from our upbringing that may cause us to not love someone within our proximity because we don't understand them or because someone perhaps did something wrong from our perspective. We might have a moral code that we believe in that if someone breaks, they're looked down upon and mistreated. So what moral laws do you believe in that may cause you to look down upon someone and mistreat them if they break it? What social categories do you embrace that leads to someone feeling outcast or even treated unjustly? What systems do we participate in that aren't helpful, but are perhaps even destructive. When we talk about pyrotheology, burning away traditions that don't advance the cause of Christ, this is what we're talking about. Many people in the world, they look at religion, they look at the Christian church, and what they see is they see a ton of religious people walking along the road and walking to the other side to continue on with keeping their purity laws and not doing all they can to help those in need. This is one of the many reasons why millions of Christians are leaving the church, but not their faith. At some point, they feel the need to abandon the institution or to preserve the main things. And this is why youth pastors statistically only last 13 to 18 months in their role on average. Many youth pastors see a gap between the programs and systems they run and the radical invitation of Christ. And this is why many non-believers from the outside looking in use the same term to describe Christians that Jesus himself used of the religious leaders of his time. Hypocrites. Why are all these people leaving their faith behind? Why are all these pastors leaving their pastoral roles behind? Why are all these Christians leaving their traditional church buildings behind? At some point, 
They see the need to do what Jesus did, to do away with the systems in order to preserve and advance what the systems were originally intended to do. Allow love to be experienced by everyone, everywhere. They recognize that Jesus didn't enter into creation, live in love and preach the way he did, then die on the cross and rise from the dead, all so that we could have worship services on Sunday and Wednesday, and so that we could have big, fun events. They recognize that Jesus came to do something much bigger than our comfortable church structures and systems. Now, at this point, I, I want to pause and clarify that I'm not saying we should leave our faith behind or the church behind, or that any pastor watching this should leave their pastoral role behind. What I'm saying is that what Jesus was calling us to is beyond and bigger than all of that. So we need to be comfortable with moving beyond some of our categories and traditions in order to fully follow the way of Jesus. We need to become increasingly more comfortable with asking uncomfortable questions. Here's what I'm getting at practically. We can all think of times in our life where we were invited to participate in something bigger than ourselves or we saw an opportunity to help someone, but we were just too busy with something else. There was a chance to volunteer for a wonderful cause, but that day and time was sports practice. There was a trip to journey to profound growth and make a huge difference along the way, but we knew it would be uncomfortable to step out of our usual rhythms. Or perhaps on a smaller scale, you were walking by someone in the hallway who looked really down and the thought crossed your mind to ask them what was going on, but instead you carried on with what you were doing. Or more uncomfortable, perhaps you saw someone on the side of the road in need where we felt the need to stop and do something about it, but we were running late on our way to church, so we didn't stop. Perhaps we were hanging out at church, playing games, and we saw someone there who wasn't being included, but we didn't stop. Why don't we stop? Why don't we live into the values that sometimes we hold so dear and claim to hold so dear? I would argue that the way things exist currently, our busy schedules and our hurried lives and our prioritization of things often stop us from participating in the things that matter most. We live in a world that is constantly in a hurry. It's in the air we breathe. Or at least, we used to live in a world that was constantly in a hurry. Hurry used to be in the air that we breathed. Traditionally, our schedules were so packed with things that the idea of slowing down to help someone seemed like a stressful and exhausting notion. Right now, though, we've been forced to slow down. And in that slowness, many of us are realizing what truly matters. Friends, family, connection, participation, and redemption. So in this slowness, pause and consider how these unwritten laws of how things are supposed to be might often supersede the law of love that Christ calls us to live out. I certainly have many things that come to my mind. Things that are in the air I breathe, ways in which I too have become hurried and exhausted and haven't participated in redemption how I would like. And I'm sure you have these things too. Whatever your mind goes to that gets in the way of loving others, these are the things that we need to burn away. These are the things that we need to do interior work and navigate to change in order that we may more fully live out the law of the cause of Christ. Perhaps we need to reevaluate what our way of life looks like and allow it to evolve into something much more meaningful and in line with the cause of Christ. Perhaps our daily lives might look different going forward. Perhaps our church community might look different going forward. Yet by different, I mean more powerful and more beautiful and more simple and meaningful. Now is the time to creatively imagine and implement a future that more fully advances the cause of Christ.